Welcome to Pharmacology. In this section, we'll talk about the GERD, which is refers to the gastroesophageal reflux disease. Some people also call it as GERD. So in this section, we'll focus mainly on the pharmacology of GRD. So bear in mind the clinical stuff and the management of the overall disease we'll, that you will go through it more in the class itself. So what is the condition of GRD or GERD? So it refers to a very, very common condition uh, that a lot of people have experienced it before, whereby this lower esophageal sphincter which actually normally constrains the gastric acid in the stomach itself, um, somehow opens a little bit, which then allows the acid in the stomach to go to move upwards into the esophagus. And do bear in mind that the esophagus, the structure of it, is not meant to withstand the acidity of the stomach. So therefore, it causes this burning sensation in people because it's like it's too acidic. It sort of like eats up that. Yeah, scales through the surface of the tissue. So in this section, uh, you're supposed to know a little bit about the symptoms of GERD, the causes, and also the treatment, which includes the pharmacological and the non-pharmacological treatment of this. So the common symptoms, which would be heartburn and acid regurgitation. Some people may experience dysphagia, which is the difficulty of swallowing, and also esophagitis, which is the inflammation of the esophagus. Heartburn refers mainly to the burning sensation at the back of the of the mouth that people will feel when you sort of like feel or taste the acid in a way. Right, so it's actually common um, for people who actually maybe um, after they have a very, very full buffet meal, for example. So the pressure somehow, it, it's the, the stomach is too full with literally. So that sphincter is a little bit loose indirectly for some people and obviously not everyone would get this and another population of people that commonly get scared is people who are pregnant so for pregnant women the baby itself um, actually imposes some pressure on the stomach which then increases the chances of having GERD in this population of people so do bear in mind there's a lot of simple lifestyle modifications that a person could undertake Right, to reduce the chances of getting this GERD attack, this heartburn attack. So simple things such as avoid excessive alcohol intake, um, cut down um, the aggravating food, right, such as fats, uh, meaning like all those fatty food, uh, fried food and things like that. Um, the weight uh, is also linked to overweight or obesity, it's also linked to GERD as well. So appropriate weight reduction will also reduce the chances of having GERD symptoms. Smoking cessation and also for people, especially those who uh, have what we call nocturnal GERD symptoms, that they only mainly get it before they sleep. So it's also quite advisable for them to actually raise the head of the bed so that the person is sort of slanting to allow not really not not really like sit up position but slightly slanting a little bit so that the gravity somehow helps the acid to stay more in the stomach than going upwards. Right. So there's a simple group of drugs, chemicals that can be used to relieve the symptoms of GERD. So these are very localized treatment, basically something very simple whereby the person, when they experience GERD symptoms like heartburn, so they just need to take the antacids and you just clear the symptoms off. So it provides very rapid relief of the symptoms. So therefore, um, it normally, the people normally take antacids when they have the symptoms or if people will have this um, GERD symptoms very frequently, it's sort of ex expected when there would, this would happen anyway, then they can take it slightly before it so that they won't experience this. Right, so this, uh, how does it work? So basically it's like a very simple neutralization chemical um, equation or interaction whereby antacids are basically weak bases, right? Obviously you can't take a strong base or strong alkaline into your, into your stomach system, it just couldn't take it. So these are just weak bases. So it will just interact directly with the gast uh, gastric hydrochloric acid to form salt and water. So therefore, um, we reduce the acidity of the stomach. Right? So if this antacid is to be taken during empty stomach, it, it will actually be cleared off from the stomach 
uh, within half an hour. So if the people, if the person takes it with food or after food, it will actually prolong the effects to about two to three hours because just because all this follows the stomach emptying time anyway. Okay, so the neutralizing capacity, uh, in a way, it reflects how strong the antacid works, right? Um, it's actually stronger for suspensions compared to tablets, um, but Nevertheless, so uh, on the labels of these antacid tablets, you realize that you always need to mention to the person that it has to be chewed thoroughly. So basically, the chewing effect will break down the size of the tablets to increase the surface area of the interaction between the tablets or the weak bases with the hydrochloric acid to make it more effective. Right, so there's a few points that you need to know as well that you need to tell the person. Who is, who is taking antacid is that you should not it should not be give be taken together with other drugs within two hours of the antacid. So why? Uh, because first of all, some drugs uh, actually requires the acidity of the stomach um, to allow it to be in a certain form so that it can be absorbed easily and to increase the absorption rate. So if the person is taking antacids, it's sort of neutralizing and making the acidity of the stomach to be reduced so it could actually cause lesser absorption of these other drugs and the second reason which is more importantly is that all these um, antacids are actually ionic in a way later you can see the examples so what happens is that these ionic um, ions uh, mineral ions have a high tendency to interact with the drug structures therefore it actually forms insoluble complex of the drugs. So obviously things which are insoluble in a way with bigger structures, it's more difficult or the body just cannot absorb it. So this properties of antacids is also termed as chelator for drugs. Drugs chelator. So therefore we try to avoid taking antacids with any other drugs because indirectly it may cause the inactivation or just inabsorption of the drugs itself. So there are important interactions, so what are those? You can just check them directly in the BNF, right? So although antacids are relatively one of the very, very safe drugs available, they are available over the counter anyway, right? Because the effects are very simple, it doesn't act uh, on any, through any receptors and so on and so forth. It's just very normal chemical neutralization interaction. Therefore, it also causes quite minimal systemic absorption of these antacids uh, but for certain populations of people for example if they have hepatic or renal impairment they should still avoid taking large amounts of these antacids right so again because it's slightly safer there's minimal systemic absorption um, it's actually quite safe to be taken in pregnant women as well okay so next we'll go through the types of antacids available so the first one here is actually calcium carbonate. It's less likely to use now, but it's still available. So what happens is that it's very good in the sense that it's very rapidly acting, but from the carbonate side of the structure, it can cause the release of carbon dioxide gases, whereby when the gases are trapped in the GI tract, or the gastrointestinal tract, it can cause belching, flatulence, nausea, vomit, nausea no vomiting, um, abdominal distension, which is unpleasant for the person. So, and another thing is that the calcium may actually induce rebound acid secretion, meaning when the effect of the calcium carbonate is wear off, uh, because it's just maximally two to three hours, it can actually somehow trigger the stomach to actually secrete more uh, HCl in the next round. So therefore, it can actually cause another round of BIRT symptoms. So that's why it requires more frequent administration if you take this calcium carbonate, meaning the effects wear off, take more effects. So effective, take more, so on and so forth. So the newer ones that we are moving towards uh, is actually another few as listed. So this is aluminium hydroxide. So again, another mineral ion. So interestingly, this aluminium ion actually causes a slow acting effect of the of neutralizing um, the gastric acid. So and it actually causes constipation because it actually relaxes the gastric smooth muscles. There's another component which is called magnesium hydroxide. You can see it's um, actually opposing opposing the effects of aluminium hydroxide, whereby magnesium is the rapid acting one. 
So, however, it actually causes diarrhea. So, it's again um, the other way around. So, therefore, if you want to get the best of both worlds, so what do you have? What imagine what would happen if you combine both aluminum hydroxide and magnesium hydroxide into as uh, one of the preparation of antacids? So, just common sense. You just combine both. You reduce the side effects. You get a slow and rapid acting effect of the antacids. Right, so meaning the effect can be very fast and the effect can last longer. Right, so there's another component which is quite interesting, which is something totally different in a way, it, which is called simeticon. Uh, this substance actually acts like a surfactant, basically it's like an anti-forming um, compound which actually relieves the flatulence and to reduce the esophageal reflux. So it's not so much of a um, neutralizing effect for simeticon. It's more as an anti forming effect. Okay, so when you compare the antacids which are available in the market, right, you can see that there's um, a few common names, right, Jalusil and so on and so forth, Malox and so on. Um, there are a lot of them are actually in combination, as mentioned just now. Some are in combination, some are single agent, as you can see over here. Some are in liquid form, some are in tablets form. Right, and there's this section here called acid neutralizing capacity. Uh, this is just to point out that it doesn't mean that, um, for example, a higher concentration of something will actually here. This or this figure here refers to milligrams per tablet. So it doesn't mean necessarily mean that the higher concentration refers to the higher effect of acid neutralizing capacity. Right, so some has higher, some has lower. So you can just refer to the chart. Okay, so hopefully this um, you need to resynthesize whatever that you have learned in this component so that you can understand this diagram. Okay, right. So um, as a concluding slide, in a way, so there's um, several stages in the management of this GERD. So the stage one, which is the simple one, which is sporadic, just randomly, uncomplicated, not very frequent. There's no additional symptoms, so it's just lifestyle modification and antacids as well. So there are some other drugs which are mentioned here like uh, histamine H2 antagonists, proton pump inhibitors and so on. Uh, we'll go through more of that in the PUD class, in a PUD section later on. Right? So um, there's also stage, the worser the stage it is, so the more frequent it is, so this, the management of the disease becomes more, um, more proactive and more uh, aggressive in a way. So, but over here we are mainly focusing on the the milder stage ones, which mainly includes the lifestyle modification and antacids. All right. So that's all for now. Thank you.